Well, good morning to everyone. It's a surprise. This is my first time in Rogers, Arkansas, and first time in this church. I've heard about this church for so long, but I've never really been here. Um, I know most of you. And uh, in looking at you this morning and in seeing your faces, I have many good memories of your relatives, brother and sister um, Johnson, Harvey Dean Johnson, good friends, been to their house many times for meals and to look at Grenada pictures. Remember Brother White? Remember he wrote a poem for me when I went back to Grenada and I don't know where that poem went, I can't find it. And then Brother Broadway, of course. I didn't know Brother Presley too well, but I knew his son went to the Bible school. So just, you know, you, you and Joyce, uh, Stephanie was at the Bible school and just, just many memories and you think about uh, where are they now, you know? This, um, there's a, a song that um, Bobby Mason sings that, and I remember Brother Harry Simon. When Brother Harry Simon came to Grenada one year for camp meeting, his mother passed away, and he and his wife were in Grenada, and he said, you know what? Let them go ahead and bury her I'll just stay for camp meeting. And that night, he and his wife sang. And uh, because of the way Brother Harry Simon worshiped, he liked to dance, and the Grenadians loved that. So during that camp meeting, I mean, we had a crowd. People were coming to camp meeting just to see Brother Harry Simon dance. But anyway, I could remember that night after he found out that his mother passed away, he and his wife sang and talked about dance that night. He sang, I wonder what are they doing up in heaven today? Where sin and sorrow have all passed away. Where peace abound like a river, they say. Tell me what are they doing up there now? I tell you what, with those who have gone before, those we knew, they're really having a time up in heaven. Brother, they knew each other. And I thought of Sister Richard and F, of course, they meant a lot to me because they were in Grenada. I thought of Brother August left. Just these wonderful, wonderful people. Folks, heaven will be heaven, not because of streets of gold. It wouldn't really mean anything to us, streets of gold. But heaven will be heaven because of Jesus and people. That will make heaven heaven, to be with people. Isn't that wonderful? When you think about it, what will, be doing, what will we be doing up in heaven? Oh, you hear people talk about all kinds of stuff they want to do. I don't know how to play the piano. I could pick on it, but I thought I'll have a nice, green, golden grand piano, and I'll be playing that thing all the time. And uh, we talk about the fruits and, and sitting down by the river and all that stuff, and when you think about it, these are just, we want to dream those things, right? I studied heaven a little bit and, and um, it's not a little bit to study about heaven. Wow. 
Can you imagine how many stories high? Because it's going to be tall. And how much, uh, how many miles? I think, I think, let me, let me put it this way from what I studied. And I wrote it down and I can't remember all of it. But if from the time of creation to now, of all the people who passed away, all the people, including the unbelievers and everybody, all the people who passed away, everybody, every single person were able to occupy for themselves 25,000, 28,000 acres. Can you imagine? That's what God has prepared for us. We cannot begin to think about what heaven is like. And we get this description of the city, but that's not all of heaven. The mind, we cannot begin to think. And you read it, you study it, and you cannot comprehend. It says, eyes have not seen, nor ears heard, what the Lord has in store for those who love him. Not everybody going to get it. Those who love him. Isn't that wonderful? Folks, we don't have too long in this life. Even if you live to be 200 years old, that cannot be compared with eternity. And we do not know when we're going to leave this world. So let us, let us hold on to something that's good, something wonderful, something that we can take with us, our salvation. God is good. God is good to us. It's good to be here. It's a beautiful church. I like the, your chandeliers. And, and it's good to be with all of you. And... It was a surprise to me when Brother Albert asked me if I'd come here. And I thought, well, yeah, it's, it's a little far, but I'll make it. <laughs> it's, it's about three and a half hours from where I am. I don't know how much it is to independence from here. But um, it's good. I like to take the opportunity whenever I can. <clears throat> God can use us in some way, um, I'll try to do what, what he wants me to do. Um, I'm going to look at Luke chapter 2, um, verse 18. It's a one, one short verse, and I'm sure you all, um, just verse 19. <clears throat> um, I usually kind of like try to have my scripture map before I come here, but I wouldn't let you know that I changed my text. <laughs> um, <clears throat> can you imagine living in a time um, of Mary and Joseph and Elizabeth and uh, what their lives were like and, and uh, maybe the humble dwellings that they had. And uh, years ago, Isaiah had prophesied that Messiah will come. Years ago. 400 years ago, 400 years ago, I'll say four to 600, but he prophesied Messiah was going to come. The one who made the universe, the one who made everything, he's going to appear on earth. Wow. You tell people today that Jesus is going to come. Jesus is going to come up. Oh, that's not so. But he came. He came when people were least expecting him. But he came to a simple virgin, a simple young lady. 
He didn't look for the prettiest. He didn't look for the one who could dress the best. He didn't look for the most popular one. But he found someone. He found someone to become the mother of the maker of the world. Anyway, we know the story that uh, the angel came and announced to her that she was chosen to be the mother of Jesus. And I am sure Mary never saw angel in her life. That was a shock. Can you imagine being somewhere and an angel will appear to you? I'm sure some people will run and be scared. But she listened. And what he said to her from then on, the scripture says in verse 19, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Can you imagine going about her daily life, what she was thinking, what will happen? And she had a lot of mixed feelings. She was human. She was human. Why me, Lord? She was happy. She was joyful. Yet there were things that she meditated upon. She was unmarried. Getting ready to marry somebody. What is going to happen to the plans that I had? She had plans for herself. But folks, sometimes God changes our plans, doesn't he? Because he has plans for us, even if we have plans for ourselves. Well, let us turn to Luke chapter 2, verse 40. And it says here, and I'm just jumping with scriptures to get to my point. It says, and the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. That same Jesus, that same Jesus that was told that she was going to be the mother, he grew. And I imagine that from the time he was born to when he was growing up, Mary had a lot to ponder in her heart. What kind of child is that? Wow. And we, we, we ask the question, that's Jesus, you know. Did he have dirty diapers? Did he need a spanking? Did he do things that other children did? In saying that, let me remind you that Jesus was 100% God. And yet, he was 100% man. He was not half and half. He was 100% human, 100% God. Isn't that something? It's wonderful when you think about it. Here, you have Mary rocking this baby who is the maker of the universe. Can you imagine that? Can you, when, when you rocked your baby, did you look at your baby? Oh, I wish I were holding Jesus, or oh, the maker of the universe. Can you imagine what Mary was imagining? She kept all those things and pondered them in her heart. And that child was filled with the Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit. Would it be wonderful today if we see young children being filled with the Spirit? He grew with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So, we're going to start, continue reading here. Um, and... When he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. 
um, they were living in Nazareth and it was the time of the Passover and they had to travel to go to Jerusalem. Um, I don't know how many of you have been to Israel, have you? Um, the place is very hilly, very hilly. And I could remember when we were going up to Jerusalem, yesterday Lillian and I went down to Branson and we went down went to some really steep and winding roads. And when you leave uh, Nazareth and you ascending to Jerusalem, you ascend to Jerusalem, you actually, I felt my ears popping. And uh, there is a, a, a hill up there, you, could have, you can't see the other side, not until you get to the top. And I had my eyes just open up. I want to see that city that they said is on a hill. I want to see that city. And as we were climbing, the driver of the bus put on that cassette, the holy city. And the tears come to your eyes. And when you see it, you just rejoice. Now I've seen the holy city. Wonderful, wonderful. But what I'm trying to say is they had to walk about, I'll say, 64 to 74 miles from Nazareth to get to Jerusalem. It will take about two or three days' journey. They have to camp out. And I imagine the roads were not paved, and they didn't have horses and so to ride on. Maybe they had a few donkeys. But it was a long trip. It was tiresome. And Jesus went with them. But when you think about it, um, his parents must have had other children at that time. So Ma Mary had a lot of responsibility because she had a child there who was the maker of the universe, the pearl of great price. He was a special child and Mary needed to keep a close eye on him, very close eye on him. Well, at that time, when they went to Jerusalem, Jesus was at a very critical age. He was between 12 and 13, and I don't know if you heard about, um, you study Bar Mitzvah. It's when a Jewish boy turns 13, he is kind of like, he's introduced to the law, he belonged to the law. Um, they study the law son of the law. So he was at that critical age where he soon will become a member of that um, bar mitzvah. He's now ready to go into um, serving the law or teaching the law, um, take part in public worship because when, when they go up to Jerusalem, the children and the women remain in what you call the women's court because your temple is not made like your church. People don't go and sit. There are no benches there. So you have the court of the Gentiles, you have the court of the women, and at that time Jesus was not able to go into the, the temple itself because he was too young. But when he reaches the age of 13, then he could go into the temple. He could be with the other men in the temple. So he was close at the beginning of that time when he could go into the temple and study. It's called a temple college. Study with the rest of the, of the, the people. Well, it says here in the scripture, and when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. And they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among the kinsfolk and acquaintance. They sought him among the kinsfolk 
and acquaintance. During the time of the Passover, Jerusalem will be very, very crowded. They will have probably 100,000 people because Jerusalem without Passover had about 25,000 people. So the place was very crowded. And as we said, that Mary had other responsibilities because she probably had other younger children. But folks, she was just supposing that Jesus was with them. And they went a day's journey and did not have Jesus with them. You know, sometimes we get too busy with what we are doing. We get too busy with our folks and our acquaintances and we forget, we suppose Jesus is in our midst and he's not. We cannot be too good to lose him from our midst. We could lose him from our company. They went one whole day's journey, and that's a long time, to find out that Jesus was not in their company. It does not take us too long for Jesus to leave our company. It does not take too long. We could neglect him in just a short time and lose him for three days or more. How many people do you know of today that used to be Christians and today are backsliders because they did not keep Jesus in their company? They found other company. They found something among the king's folk that attracted them, and they did not realize that Jesus has left them. The Spirit of God could leave you. You could neglect him for one day, and his presence will not remain with you because he is a priority. It's not that Mary was a bad person, but she missed him. She lost him from her company. She thought maybe he was sleeping with the other kids or sleeping with the other women, spending the night with them. So she was supposing. Christian people, we cannot suppose. We cannot suppose it's okay with our hearts. We cannot suppose everything is going to be fine. We have to consult Jesus on a daily basis. So when we pack our things and we get ready to leave, are we going to take Jesus with us or are we going to leave him behind? What they did was something that was not really good because, you see, Jesus was the pearl of great price. He should have been a priority. He should have been number one. And today it's a lesson for us. Are we making him our number one? Are we making him or priority. Um, where, did we, where did we lose him? You know, we went for Thanksgiving. We're getting ready for Christmas. We are so busy with these things, busy visiting with our acquaintances and our kinsfolk that we left Jesus out. How many of our conversations on Thanksgiving Day included Jesus? Did we talk about Jesus and give our testimonies and how good he has been to us? Or was it all taken up with what we're going to do for Christmas? And who's going to cook this? And who's going to buy this? And where are we going to go? Folks, these things might look like little things to you, but to God they're big things. We have to, we have to put him first in our lives. They were good parents, but they were given a responsibility. We as Christian people, we have a responsibility. And it might not be anything big, but it'd be, it be something small. But Jesus is going to hold us accountable for what we did with the little that he gave us to hold as a pearl of great price. Um, the devil 
is so powerful, even if we know that God is all powerful, but he's there to snatch away anything that is good from us, to snatch away anything that God gives us. And what it says about them later on, and when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. And they did something good. Wise men still seek him today. They did not find him in their company. They turned around. And, you know, God is so merciful that when we slip, when we miss him out of our company, we could always go back. But some people, some people tend to not go back. Some people put that going back for a longer period. Have you ever seen backsliders that struggle to get saved again? Because they put it off too long and God's spirit does not always strive with men. We have to, once we realize something is wrong, we have to go back. And they had to go back to Jerusalem, back to Jerusalem him. Today, we have to be so careful that uh, if we realize he is not with us, let's go back. Let's go back and find him where we lost him. Find him where we left him. And what happened to them? It came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. What did I tell you? He was at that age where he could enter the temple. And uh, the doctors and the lawyers, they went there for studying the word, studying the law. They call it the temple college. And uh, that's where they were able to find Jesus. It says, they were all astonished. All that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. They were heavy hearted. They were burdened. Something had left them. They had lost something. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? Wow. That's really Today, if your child will talk to you that way, you will say that's rude. Huh? That's not the appropriate answer to give your parents. You mind your own business, let me mind mine. That's how we say it in our, in our own terms. But that's not what Jesus was saying. Remember, remember, God gave Mary a long time to ponder things in her heart. And remember the scripture says something about her, a sword shall pierce her heart. All these things she had in mind. And he asked her, we see not that I must be about my father's business. And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Now, um, <clears throat> how much, how much do we sorrow? 
when we figure or fail to keep Jesus or give him first place in our lives. Now, many times we start, many people start the day, day without him. Something could have prevented. You're too late for work, you did not get up in time, your alarm did not go off, you have to get to work. And uh, then you start the day without him and things start happening. And you check back and you say, oh, I didn't take time to pray. I didn't take time to do this. I didn't take time to do that. Remember, God first. God first. You pack in to go on your vacation. God first. God first. Remember that. Um, it's not something we're playing with. It's the pull of great price. We have to put him first in our life. Or, sorrowfully, when we lose him, we have to go back to Jerusalem. In other words, let me put it this way, we have to do our first works over. You know, some people sin, and they say you could pick up from there. That's not how it is. You have to do your first works over. And that's what they have to do. For three days, they had to travel back to Jerusalem and <clears throat> find Jesus where they left him. Today, we ask ourselves, when we get with our acquaintances and our company, do we put him first in our lives? Another thing um, that uh, we talk about is that uh, people not putting Christ first uh, in their lives. It seems as though Christian people, we form habits. Like we get up on morning and it's prayer time before we get ready for work. Or you have a set time where you want to have your devotions. It doesn't always work. And a problem, and I heard one person say that, well, not more than, more than one, but one person actually said it in church that, um, Sometimes I fall asleep when I'm praying. And I thought, well, if you fall asleep when you're praying, you didn't get anywhere. You did not pray. So the best thing that we can do with our pattern is to change our pattern. Save time for the Lord when you are not tired and sleepy. He's going to hear you. But when you kneel there and fall asleep, what are you telling him? What are you telling him? We have to spend time with him, put him first in our lives, read our Bible and pray, but do not do it when you think you're going to fall asleep. That's why we do not get a lot of our prayers answered. We have people fall asleep at the altar. Many, many times in Grenada, we have people that to go wake them up. They fall asleep because, you know, I don't know if you've had that experience, but... Uh, we have to make time for Jesus when we are alert. Um, I, what I get from, from this scripture is, wisty not that I must be about my father's business. Jesus was not sent into this world to be a carpenter. He was not learning to be a carpenter from Joseph. So when he said, wist ye not that I must be about my father's business, he was not referring to, to Joseph and his carpenter shop. Um, turn to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 42, and... Uh, as I say, I didn't have my scripture mapped out because, um, because I kind of switched things a little bit. But I wanted to know what was his business. And he says... The 
this is his business. He came as a light to the Gentiles. This is his business. I came to open the blind eyes. That was his business, not to be a carpenter. To bring out the prisoners from the prison, not to be a carpenter. And them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to grieving images. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare before they spring forth. I tell you of them. Um, so, what the Lord came for was to help others, to love others, to bring light to the Gentiles. And I like his promises, and that's God's business. That's all his business. He says in chapter 43, starting with verse 1, part of it, he says, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. He says, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. That's God's business. God is not uh, um, today looking to condemn, looking to do whatever he can do now to destroy the wicked. That's not his business at that time. God is trying to help mankind. He was trying to, to help them to see why he came, to acknowledge his presence in their midst. God is a faithful God, and he wants us to be um, that faithful to him. He talks about blotting out our transgressions. He came to save. He came to bring new life and new hope in our lives. And with that, he does not want us to be careless with what we have. Salvation is a prize. It is something that the Lord has given to us that only special people can have it. And that's the people who acknowledge him and believe on him. Christian people are special in the eyes of God. And his business, and he's doing a lot of that, is to help us today from where we are, to live a life for him. Each day that we live, we live a better life. Uh, we have to be thankful that Jesus came that we can have life, that we can have abundant life. But we have to learn a lesson from Mary and Joseph leaving Jesus behind. When we go somewhere, we do not leave him behind. We take him with us everywhere we go. He should be number one in our lives because without him, we leave home and things happen and we regret, regret, why didn't we? Why didn't we take him with us as we left this morning? Why didn't we acknowledge him before we left this morning? Something is wrong, let's turn around. Let's do what we need to do. Let's pray, let's read, study the word, memorize the word. Because you know what? While he's doing his father's business, we need to be doing 
the business that he gave us to undertake. He gave us something to use for him, to do for him. So let us be faithful. And one of these days, the rewards are going to be ours if we are faithful to what he, he gave us to do. And um, I did not know uh, about their church attendance and who all going to be here, I, whether I know the people or not. So I asked the Lord to just give me something simple. And um, as I said, I had to change a little bit on the last moment. But uh, we're thankful to be here today. And uh, thank you all for coming. Amen.